Anyway, we've got a very distinguished professor as our guest tonight. But, it, but I, I mean, we're talking about Clive Palmer. He's a professor. And, and where's, he a, where's he a professor? He'll tell you. Well, I, I'm going to ask him. Introduce him fairly and properly. OK, I'll do that. Well, I'll and he's a Queenslander. Everybody fairly and properly. And he's a Queenslander. Indeed. Well, in our Canberra studio is Clive Palmer, and I must say, I have not had more calls about an interview ever for what, from what, the shows that we've done. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, the people are getting very excited yeah. about this. Yeah, they weren't interested in listening to you. They want to hear from Clive. Uh, well, they're certainly not interested in listening to you. The can public we hear speak Clive? all the time. We're going to hear him. I... Can we? No, I'm just, can I just say welcome to Clive Palmer? <laughs> It's great to be here, Richo. Good on you, Alan. You're a great guy. <laughs> oh, see, it's started already. That's it. The, the, the you love did in. your first throw. Come on. The love in. All right. Well, actually, Alan said to introduce you as Professor Clive Palmer. Now, uh, I keep reading you're not a professor. Are you a professor or not? And if so, where are you a professor? Well, I was a professor at Deakin University and then at Bond University. But when I got elected to Parliament, none of the universities wanted me anymore. You can't be a professor and be in Parliament, apparently, because they, they think you're, you're sort of biased. So... I'm not a professor, but I'm a citizen of Australia and I love it. Well, I don't think there's much dispute about Clive, you being one, a of the, one of the darker moments was the Peter Credlin affair when mm. you said, why should Australian citizens and businesses be taxed and working women discriminated against just so the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff can receive a massive benefit when she gets pregnant? Do you regret mm. those comments? I do on a personal nature and I said an apology the very first thing in the morning, I didn't mean any personal harm to her, but what I was trying to highlight was that a woman as smart and successful as she is and uh, earning a great salary uh, would get a very large benefit out of the pay parental lead if she was in private industry. And of course uh, another woman, a stay-at-home mum, would get nothing. Someone on a farm working hard with her husband wouldn't get anything. And I thought that was inequitable. But, but Clive, you know that if Peter Credlin or Tanya Plibersek had a baby, under public service rules, they get mm. full pay for six months. That already exists in the public sector. Now, why don't you then seek to dismantle that if you think the whole thing's inequitable? Well, for me, I think the whole thing's inequitable. I'm a, I've employed a lot of women who have paid parental leave because our company gives it to them, because it's an employer-employee thing. I don't think it should be something that the government cuts into. We need smaller government. It's surprising the Liberals want to get bigger. We need smaller government, really. But and I'm uh, saying it's already there. But the I, public I, sector have got it. But I think in this case, you know, you, they should pull it back because of the public sector... Of course why, they should. Why should that's what a public sector get, why get you do six that? months? Why should they? Well, I think Tony Abbott should. And I think you should take the lead in that, Alan. He, he, he listens to you and you're a person with great... Uh, skills of convincing people, so let's see you do it. He's never convinced me of anything. <laughs> I, I, I'll have to disagree with you there for a start. Clive, you're a businessman. Uh, yep. And businessmen are meant to note the difference between black and red in terms of the figures on a page. You're mm -hmm. down as saying, and have I got you right, that you want a 15% income tax cut, you don't want to lift the GST, you want pensions to be increased by 150 bucks a fortnight, You've got $80 billion more for health and schools and disability services. Where does that money come from? Well, I want all those things, and I want a vision for Australia how we get them. And we need to project forward. If we abolish the carbon tax and the mining tax, what then? We've got to create more wealth, and there's a lot of ways that we can do that. First of all, with provisional tax, we can, instead of paying it up front before you've earned the money, businesses could pay it at the end of the year. That would free $70 billion in the Ford estimates in the next two years, in the next year, actually, for the Australian economy. We can have more hospitals, more schools, a rising standard of living, a greater revenue and more wealth creation. But, People not moving into more jobs because there'd be Clive, more money everyone out agree, there. Everyone agrees with this. We don't live in the ideal world. The International Monetary mm. Fund said our spending is the fastest growing of 17 like countries surveyed, that real public <laughs> spending, this is, the, this is the International Monetary Fund, is going to increase mm. by 16% unless mm. something is done to the budget. The World mm. Bank says we're the most expensive jurisdiction in the G20. I mean, here you are saying, and there's a whole stack of them, the more of them say the same mm. thing. The Commission of Audit well, said well, if we keep well, going I've the way we are within a decade, well. we'll have to find uh, another 70-something billion dollars. We are going uh, downhill in terms of the gap between expenditure and revenue, and you're wanting to spend more. Well, that's not right, really, if you look at the overall situation. We're the third lowest debt uh, 
country in the OECD. 12.5% of our debt of GDP is G of GDP. The OECD average is 73%. So there isn't a debt problem at the moment. I know from being in business, the market changes, the mood changes every three or four years. Of course, we've got a very low base, and that's what we we may be increasing fast from a low base, but we've got a very very low base. There's no need to panic. We don't need to take $15 off our pensioners for going to the hospital twice a week. We don't need to put people in poverty. We don't need to increase taxes like the debt tax, like the Liberal Party's done. You know, certainly Clive, if you, the Liberal if, if Party you were driving, I know is a low taxation party. If you were driving out to the Brisbane airport and you're yeah. only you're only a couple well, of miles out of the city, much, yeah. and you're only a couple of miles out of the city, and there are signs up which say, accident ahead, accident ahead, and it's flashing to you in a red light. You'd be mm -hmm. mugged to keep going. You'd most probably get the car and turn around. Now, what the International Monetary Fund are saying is that yeah. our growth in expenditure is the third worst in the world. Only Slovenia and Spain well, are worse than we yeah. are. Don't, well, don't no, those you, red you lights do say we've statistics. got to turn around? Well, no, actually, we're not in Brisbane going to the Brisbane airport. We're in Tasmania heading for Brisbane. That's the reality of it, you know. And uh, it's all been blown up. And, of course, we don't need to do what we're doing. President Obama in the United States has injected $85 billion into his economy. He's made President America Obama. stronger. Clive, but, he's but, not your but, hero, but is he? Country. He's got $17 well, trillion for... dollars in debt. President Let, Obama. Let's, let's stick to Australia. <laughs> I, 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 I think we can, we, can, we can stick here. But, but Clive, it's I mean, it's I, not about debt, it's about wealth, but, 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 you know, it, America's the wealthiest some, country in the world. Clive, there's got to be some cuts in the out years. I mean, Because I, I actually agree with you and disagree with Alan. I don't believe there's a crisis this afternoon. But I do believe in the mm. three to four, five year period, you start to get one. How are you going to cut uh, any, anything from government spending in those years? I mean, what, what do you say you'll cut? Because something will have to go. Well, if you look at how I would look at the budget is a totally different situation. There's a lot of big items in the budget which we can improve on. For example, we're spending $37 billion projected ahead for looking at the new submarine. We could buy an off-the-shelf submarine design, do it for about $10 billion, save $30 billion. That makes sense to me. Our NBN, that's $45 billion or something. It's really there to cover a, about a $5 billion gap where we haven't got good coverage. We could spend that money on that, save $40 billion on that. Our paid parental leave scheme, which I know Alan loves, uh, we, we'd save another $20 billion. You know, it, it just goes on and on without uh, looking and hitting our pensioners and people that can at least afford to pay it. Um, that's to, why waste all this money? And then we can look at the functions of government, how people work, and, and no one's looking at that and making it more efficient. Sure, we can do better. We can make our health better. We can make a lot of things better. But in the meantime, we haven't got a panic. Look, I, I do agree with you on the uh, NBN, and I do agree with you on the submarine issue. But I, there is what I'm trying to say, Clive, and I, as a businessman, I'm expecting you to understand this. We're looking down the track here. Currently, when we look at revenue, we now find that 48% of all the tax-paying units in Australia, by the time you take in welfare transfers and payments, pay no tax at all. 80% of single families pay no tax at all. Now, as you then narrow the base, widen the base of those that are not paying, who's going to pay down the track? Well, well, Alan, that's a very good point. We need to increase our government revenue. And, of course, what you've got to realise, the Australian government is the number one petitioner of bankruptcies and liquidations in this country. And, of course, you know, that's taking people from gainful employment where they're paying group tax and providing revenue from the government on Descenderlink. No one wants to do that. Why don't we have a Chapter 11 like they do in the United States when the business continues, the exports continues, the jobs continues, the growth continues, and, of course, the owner of the business, like me, would lose his equity? 85% of all companies going to Chapter 11 after 11 emerge for it. No, the Australian government kills our enterprises and kills our companies. And that's a, that's a bad thing. We need to change it. But surely one of the things that kills them, and you know this as a businessman, your biggest bill is the wage bill. That's the biggest bill. Now, here we are in Australia where our minimum wage is more than 50% higher than Europe, Canada, Britain and New Zealand. In other words, you can't appoint anyone full-time on less than $649.20 a week, which is 33000 bucks a year. There are many young people out there, unemployed. There are many people coming out of jail. There are many disabled people. Happy to work for twenty grand. They can't. That, shouldn't that be dismantled? Well, first of all, our wages are a lot lower than they are in Japan. 
And I think Japan gets a lot of our resources and has become the second largest economy in the world. For example, we can export nickel ore at $50 a tonne. They process it through at $20,000 a tonne. They sell it in the world market for. And they've got higher wages, higher energy, and they suffer from the tyrannies of distance. Let's get our resources from Queensland and Western Australia. Let's establish those plants with our, our $1.5 trillion of superannuation funds that are invested offshore and make this company country do what it can really do and get the lowest cost downstream resourcing in the world and, and, and play to our strengths. That's what but, we need but to how do. Much not can we go on? How much longer can we, can we go on with an hourly minimum rate of $17 here, the USA mm -hmm. $7.01, the UK $9.40, Canada $9.80, France $11.70. You know as a businessman, you're going out the back door on competitiveness with those rates of pay. Well, I think it's productivity that matters, and I think we've got to look at how we can do things better and maintain our, our standard of living. Of course, if what you're saying is true, our dollar wouldn't be as high as it is. The investment inflow into Australia wouldn't be as great as it is because people see opportunity here, other people from other areas, and we should be seeing those opportunities ourselves, and our government should be leading us to them so we can be a, a stronger, better nation, and man can be like he was meant to but be, free Clive, and independent. Clive, That's can I ask you, though... You've got these yourself. prescriptions. Yeah, you've, that, you've, got these, show, yeah. you've got these answers, but I want to ask ask well, you, you ask about your own, <laughs> your own businesses, um, because mm. Coolum is a place that I've been going to since the late eighties. It was one of the great mm. resorts of Australia, with one of the great resort golf courses. You go it, Still when is. you you bought it a couple of years ago. It had fifty eight percent occupancy with height. It's got naught percent today. You can fire a shotgun through the place. You won't need anyone, guest or staff. Now, what have you done to Coolum? I've made it a great place for me to live, Alan. You know, it's, uh, you know, why work so hard? Oh, sorry, Richard. It's a great place. It's a great golf course. But we've got a lot of people that are there. And, of course, it wasn't making a profit any of those years. And it's much more profitable now. And that's what business is but about. But it hasn't got anyone staying a, there. How can it be profitable? Well, look, you know, what's the point of having a billion dollars if you can't buy something you like? I agree with you. It's a great golf course. I like the restaurants. I love it. It's a great place to be. That's why the people of Coolum, of Fairfax, selected me with 50.3% of the vote to represent them in Parliament. But you've got they a whole, know that I care but about them. You've got a whole heap of unit holders suing you because you, you basically locked them out. And, I mean, it's not as if this no, is we going well. Them out, Alan. Well, that, that, they but, say they have. Well, They're suing well, of you. Of course they do. But. But they're all from Sydney and Melbourne. They don't like the fact that we've opened the resort up for all the local people to come in. On, on the 27th of this month, we've got a Fairfax Day where 100,000 people from my electorate have been invited to come to our resort to see an Elvis Presley concert, or the world's number one impersonator, to see the, uh, our auto museum, see dinosaurs at night, enjoy the resort. It'll be packed out of people. Why don't you and Richo come up and do a live broadcast? <laughs> see the dinosaurs, play that golf, enjoy yourself again. I don't you know deserve it. You see the dinosaurs yeah. every day in, in I, Parliament, don't you, Clive? Look, I, hey? I do, but look, I, look, Al, I've just got to say, I've admired you for so many years since you're the Australian coach of the Rugby Union. You're just a fantastic guy. You've oh. done a great job. And the two of you together have got great chemistry. It's diversity of opinion. It's the battle of an idea. That's what's more important for our country. Ideas, ideas. Do you get any ideas from our politicians on any side? Very, very hard. Squeeze them as hard as you like. All right. Uh, no uh, ideas Clive, will pop we're going to have to get a few ideas in a break because we're going to have one okay. right now. We'll be back in just a second with Clive Palmer. And welcome back to Richo and Jones, where uh, we've got Clive Palmer in our Canberra studio. And Alan, I yeah. think, is about to talk yeah. to him about yeah. the state of Queensland. Yeah. Uh, Clive, if I could just take you to Queensland. Um, there was yeah. once a Crime and Misconduct Commission where those mm -hmm. appointed to it, uh, they had to be bipartisan appointments. No one could be appointed unless someone from both sides agreed. That has been That's changed right. by legislation. So mm -hmm. the Newman government can now snack, stack the Crime and Misconduct Commission. They have now sent you to the Crime and Misconduct Commission. Sini is saying that he has evidence against you that you sought to corrupt the process of government. How do you respond mm -hmm. to that? Well, he made those, uh, those uh, allegations two and a half years ago against the alleged event on a Friday afternoon in the ABC, and he said he was going to refer me to the Crime and Misconduct Commission on the, on the Tuesday, the following Tuesday. It was a long weekend. But, of course, he looked at his file over the weekend and he saw that he'd written to me on at least f four occasions congratulating me in the transparent manner which I'd carried out my discussions with him on those particular dates. So it was quite clear that he was lying. So rather than support, r report me to the Crime and Misconduct Commission, which would have been a criminal offence for reporting someone that had uh, done the wrong thing, it, it was innocent, 
he decided to send my files over and declined to report me. Now, of course, the Crime and Misconduct Commission, Ken Lay, the fellow they appointed, uh, was being uh, interviewed by the uh, Parliamentary CMC Committee and he lied to them. He was about to be charged with perjury and Newman changed the legislation to save him, then appointed him chairman. Now he's been investigated by the police. He uh, eliminated the bipartisan If I could just stop the you there, because I think in a way mm -hmm. you're going so quickly. Uh, the point you just made is very valid. In other words, the yep. acting chairman of the Crime and Misconduct Commission in Queensland mm -hmm. perjured himself before a parliamentary committee, in other words, told mm -hmm. lies about the extent That's to right. which the Newman government had approached yeah. him to write a beneficial story in the newspaper flattering of the Newman government. He denied That's that right. had happened until a Newman staffer also called before the parliamentary committee actually had to acknowledge that he had approached this fellow, Lay, to make, write that story. That man is still the head of the Crime and Misconduct Commission. Well, what happened was the Premier and the Parliament dismissed the Crime and Misconduct Commission. We've got you. Keep going. And uh, he dismissed them. And then they changed the act to, to take away the bipartisan nature of it so that the Premier now can veto investigations and he can run them. And the first thing they did was try to take an allegation against me for political purposes. Well, let me just take that point we, about the allegation yeah. against you because I was yeah. just checking the correspondence. Is it true, isn't it, that Sini wrote to you on April 20, 2012, on May 9, 2012, Newman wrote yeah. to you on September 20, 2012, Sini wrote That's to right. you on September 12, 2012, that showed the state government and all of those very flattering and willing to deal with Palmer and your company. Indeed, Sini said on April 20, I congratulate you for your efforts to date, which are contributing to the long-held vision of the Galilee Basin becoming a major new resource region. Yeah. Sini said then, subsequently, two years later, he wanted special treatment. He wanted us, our government, to act inappropriately. Yet you've mm -hmm. got, there is correspondence in December of 2012, where Sini says, mm -hmm. Dear Clive, I reiterate my preparedness to meet with you personally on a regular basis and I value the progress we've made on repairing the relationship between your company and our government. That's a letter in December. Yeah. He is saying six months previous you attempted to corrupt the government. Well, that's true. Of course, what really happened was that he wrote to people that spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the Gailey Basin, stopped their project and gave the project to an Indian company which had been fined 200 million rupees by the Indian government for trying to corrupt their government and doing wrong things in India. Did the Indian government later, stump up money to the Queensland government in order to be preferred ahead of you? I don't think so, but, but uh, I think uh, someone may have stumped up money to somebody. And it wasn't just me, it was five other people. We won an open tender, uh, myself and four other companies, with the uh, uh, you know, open tender with the Bly government. And then we've discovered in a court proceeding a, a minute from the North Queensland bulk ports where the Premier says, because GVK has told me that these other companies are interfering with it, I want to cancel their approvals. Not for the good government of Queensland. But this has been going on for a long time. It's a sad state of play for Queensland. I'm very sad that I've got a Deputy Premier who's a liar. I'm very sad that I, I've got a Crime and Misconduct Commission who's more like a Gestapo. And it's not just me. I'm the least of the people to worry about. There's so many citizens of our state which have lost their rights, that have been held in detention by police, that have, have been, uh, you know, the whole laws have changed in Queensland. People don't realise what's gone on. And of course, the debacle, uh, how well, the judiciary and the separation of powers, well, it's just a terrible well, situation. Why, uh, the, the, this is a very valid point. Why isn't the nation concerned? I see this as one of the worst forms of government that you could run to. Now, here we've had a Chief Justice just appointed from the Magistrates Court. This is a bloke from Milmeron who was a meat worker and then became a, a cop and then did a course in law. And he's never appeared, as I understand, in any major case anywhere. You've got the Solicitor General saying, look, you're not qualified. I'm resigning. You should decline the commission. Why has this bloke been appointed by Newman as Chief Justice of Queensland, and why is the Attorney General Blay now running around telling everybody in the Parliament this is the way, if you get criticism, you answer that criticism? You smell a rat here, don't you? Well, I certainly think it's unusual to appoint a Chief Justice that's not for the Supreme Court. I don't know about the individual concerned or, or that, that he's ever done anything wrong. We've got to be make sure we don't contact just attack him so much as attack the process and what's going on. And certainly... Uh, Newman has been very, very uh, 
critical of the judiciary in his time as Premier, because after all, it's the judiciary that stands up for those things. But one of the rarest commodities in life is political courage. Not many people have it. And um, you exhibited it, Alan, on, on your radio program about this issue. You took the lead calling on a Royal Commission. And I know when our Senators take their position in the Senate in the next couple of weeks, they'll be pushing for a Senate Select Committee of Inquiry into, into what's been happening in Queensland so that the people of Queensland can come forward and tell their story. So Australians can know what's really happening and appropriate action can be taken. We've seen a whole lot of situations happen where you know, uh, chief of staff of people like senior have become lobbyists for companies. There's been a lot of money paid to those uh, companies and, and there's been a Queensland uh, people and Australians that have missed out. And this has gone on right and right through the, through the state. Now they want to sell our hospitals and sell our schools so that they, to their lobbyist mates to make money. And really, I think people have got to stop it. I've been the, the uh, person trying the hardest that I could. And you know, what City did to me and how they were trying to set me up is a good example of what's happened to so many Queenslanders that are much more important, don't have the means to defend themselves that I do. Well, you, you certainly do, Clive. But look, I, I'm going to ask you a couple of, of other questions because I can't pick up a newspaper without you being criticised. I mean, you, you get, yeah. you're getting a bucket a day. Now, I've, I've been getting a yeah. bucket a day for 40 years, and, but sometimes yeah. there are easy ways to clear it up. Now, one of the things that I keep reading about, and I think all of Australia knows about, is the fact that you are allegedly building the Titanic. But no one can yeah. find a shipyard with which you've signed a contract. No one can find a shipyard where it's being built. So now clear it up for everybody and, and just tell us where is it being built? What's the name of the shipyard? Well, the shipyard's Jin Ling, and of course we've had a press release out from them, and the press have been up to see them. And we were number one in the world's Twitter when we announced it, and they're they're in China. Uh, of course. You know, when you build the original Titanic, it took about seven years to design and get everything ready to go. It's taken us about two, two and a half years to get that. We're dealing with a team of international architects, uh, shipbuilders, uh, marine scientists, a whole range of people who get the Titanic underway. And we hope to lay the keel down later on this year. Um, and that's what we're doing with the Titanic. It's been going that way ever since. But I'm being criticised by a lot of people for a lot of things. Most of them are not true. Because uh, the status quo in Australia, they don't like the fact that someone's come from nowhere and uh, holds the balance of power in the Senate. And uh, a lot of people are not comfortable with so, that. All right, but just to be specific, you've signed a contract with Jin Ling and construction... Ha has construction started? No, we're planning to lay the keel down later on this year. And uh, uh, we're looking on about December. We're, at the moment, looking at building the cabins on shore. We want to build the cabins first to make sure that we're, we're happy with them before we put them in the final ship. All you know, right. It's a lot harder building the Titanic today than it was 100 years ago. Well, it didn't work too well 100 years ago, but it works better this time. <laughs> uh, can I, yeah. I just move on? Because your business interests are always being criticised. And, and always, it's interesting yeah. that you're talking about China, where you're building the Titanic, or about to build the Titanic, yeah. you say. And, of course, it's from China that most of the criticism comes in this company called Citic. Now, again, mm -hmm. I read the papers. And, and there's supposed to be $12 million taken out of an account during the last election campaign, <clears throat> and Citic yeah. are basically claiming you knocked it off. <clears throat> I think that's... I mean, it's a, a, a crude way of putting it, but I think that's what they're saying, you knocked it off. Now, what happened well, to the $12 million? Well, that money's... Um, the particular $12 million you're talking about is in the account. It's available to them at any time. It's a surplus of funds that are in there. Of course, they haven't paid us for hundreds of millions of dollars of iron ore that they've sent back to China, and they think they can take Australian resources and not pay for them. So I'm a person that's got enough money to be able to fight them in court. They're owned by the Chinese government, and their modus operandi is just not to pay their bills, and most Australian companies can't afford to take them to court. They just go bankrupt. But I wasn't prepared to do that because I believe in the integrity of our sovereignty and I believe in standing up to the Chinese that, that wanted to do that. But, but you but say that, Claude, just, just to say, Claude, you, you say that, but, but I also read now that because of what's happening in the federal court, the police are investigating this $12 million. Well, no policeman's ever contacted me. And there's no complaint that I know, and I think this is just another beat-up by, uh, you know, by Hedley Thomas, to be honest with you. It's just fatuous as far as I'm concerned. So, so as far as you're concerned, there's no problem with any of this? I don't think so. There's no complaint. I'm not under any charges. There's no legal action being taken against me. But, of course, I've commenced legal action against Mr Sini today. And that hasn't been reported. How long have you been... How long were you a member of the Liberal Party? And are you a life member of it? Or were you? Well, I first joined the, um, the, the Country Party in 1969. And in 1992, I was made the youngest life member of the, of the National Party. I'd been the uh, uh, party spokesman in the 1986 election. 
Um, and of course, when they merged with the Liberal Party, I was automatically made a life member of the Liberal Party. I then became a, so, a delegate to their federal council. It's so, so, about 40 years or more. So the reason I just ask you that question, do you think that they're frightened of what you know? Well, I know quite a bit, Al, <laughs> and I know a lot of the people because I've had a long-standing relationship with many of them. But I think you can't attack individuals. You have to look at the policies and the ideas. I'm 60 years of age. I, I, for whatever reason, I find myself in Parliament. And, uh, you know, I had a good conversation with some palliative care nurses and I asked them, what was the one thing that people regret when, they, when they're dying? And they said that it was not being themselves and not, not saying the things they could have said. I took that advice on board and I've decided to come out of my cocoon and uh, say what I think's right for the country. I've never thought you uh, as being in a cocoon. I want to ask you one last question then. Ricky Muir, I saw the Mike yep. Willis interview. Now, I understand ordinary citizens getting elected to the Senate and I understand most ordinary citizens don't understand all there is to know about politics. But this bloke got elected nine months ago and he turns mm -hmm. up a week ago absolutely unable to answer anything. How can you be that hopeless and are you proud to have him in your team? I'm certainly proud to have him in my team because he's a person of integrity. What you do is far more important than what you say in our life, but we put a lot more, more emphasis on what people say. Now, I had an hour-long interview with Mike Willis. He's quite serious about politics. That wasn't shown. He did interviews in the United States dealing with people very high up in the US administration that have worked with me internationally, and they, they spoke favourably about me. That wasn't shown. He was only looking for a story. It was a very biased piece in my point of view. But Ricky Muir has got five kids. He works in a sawmill. He can't afford to take nine months off to prepare for the sale. No, he doesn't have to he take nine months off. He can read a newspaper, Clive. He needs the money Clive. for his mortgage. No, no, he can he read he a needs, newspaper. It's not, it's not that hard. Well, I, I think, you know, for you, uh, Richo, extremely talented guy in the media, someone like me that's experienced going on television, it's easy. But for someone like him that's never been on TV, you get a bit of the nerves, you know, and he just wanted to have a glass he of water. He certainly had a big dose of those. Clive, he's now going yeah. to have a say in how I live, how I work and how I play, and that scares me. Yeah. If he's honest, it'll well, be a lot better than some who are there. Well, I, I can well, tell you. Well, I d if he's honest, it'll be a long way ahead of some who are there. Yeah, it, it helps. Well, it helps unless you know Ricky's name. Eh? You know, could you name me the 12 New, New South Wales senators? Uh, no way in the world. It, m most of them no one's ever heard. <laughs> I think I'd stop at about 10. But look, Clive, I'm sorry, we'll have to uh, leave it there. I'm over time. And Representative Swill, they said. Uh, God bless you both. <laughs> no, that's not right. I was a senator. I was definitely not <laughs> unrepresentative. I was definitely not Swill. <laughs> Thank you, Clive. God bless we'll you talk both. to you again we love soon. You. Thanks, okay. Clive. Thank you for your time. Clive Palmer in bye Canberra, bye. and we will have to go. We'll be back in just a sec. Thanks for your company here on Rich Owen Jones. The old Clive Palmer did pretty well. I thought he did very well. The, the one thing about Palmer is he's not stupid and um, he's got a few guts. Well, I'm going to check on some of the things he people. said and sure. I'll report next week. Mm, he'd because expect. There's, always, there's always a controversy about him mm. and it, the, now we've got a name of a, of a shipyard. We'll get on to them and I'll find out exactly I, I where think, this is up. I think his problem is that he was so erratic, politically erratic, that he lost credibility. The stuff about Credlin, the stuff about I want more office staff, I want the status of a minor party. Oh, and Lindy Dunn's a Chinese spy and yeah, all, like... all that stuff. And and that that you lose credibility. Now you've got to rebuild all of that. But if he does that and uses his mandate in the Senate sensibly, then Australia could well be better off. Because he's not stupid and he's able to see issues with some clarity. And I think the fact that he's a bit different, people quite like. Let's be honest. He's just not one of those boring people but, who makes these platitudinous comments that drive you nuts. But see, even you just said, if. I mm. mean, this is all very iffy. What if he doesn't do that? Well, what if uh, he uses uh, that power badly? Yeah, I'm not interested in sort of getting the crystal ball out and looking into the future. I'm just saying, well, let's wait till July 1 and he'll be under the microscope like everybody else. But he has a golden opportunity to deliver and to build some credibility with the Australian people. And if this holds some of these people down there to greater account than currently is the case, well and good.